Thank you very much, Amy. It's uh, it's easy to do a good job when you have such a great group to work for, but also a great membership that you serve. Uh, most of you know me, of course, uh, through MNL most recently, but uh, the last 12, almost 15 years, I've been connected to the sector in one form or fashion, whether it was with the Department of Municipal Affairs, uh, through the Fire Commissioner's Office, or one of the many other government departments that I provided communication support for. And uh, I really feel, and I've said this to many of you in this room before, I feel like I'm finally home. This is the, the job I thoroughly enjoy, and uh, I want to thank all of you for making it such a pleasurable experience because uh, when you see so many committed leaders and uh, committed individuals uh, to our communities, um, it makes uh, our job that much easier and we feel very, very motivated because of the great work you're doing. So today's uh, last presentation, um, I'm glad to be last on the agenda because a couple, two events ago, I was the first one on the agenda and I didn't really like that, <laughs> but the uh, going last seems to be uh, great because I get some of the last words. But uh, today we're talking about physician recruitment and retention, uh, an issue near and dear to many of our hearts, uh, small, medium, and large-sized municipalities. And uh, we've been doing a big piece of work over the last two years with uh, a number of partners to, uh, to truly identify a number of things. Number one, what is it that we can do as a group of municipalities? Uh, but more importantly, what truly is our role when it comes to healthcare recruitment and retention? The last two years, um, I've dug in very, very deep on this. I've spoken to many of you. Um, I would venture to say the, the majority of, of our members. And I've heard your, your, um, your challenges. I've heard uh, some great stories of wonderful things you're doing. Um, and most importantly, I was provided encouragement to, to continue on and support uh, the other municipalities that are seeming to struggle and, and have difficulty when engaging on this very, very important issue. So our work started back, um, oh, sorry, on the agenda, I'm gonna run through uh, four things. We're going to talk about the background of how we got to today a little bit more. I'm gonna talk through the recommendations, uh, very quickly talk about the bigger picture after today, and of course, the next steps on what we will be doing at MNL to, uh, to advance this issue. So it started uh, essentially back in August, uh, 2021, when a municipal engagement committee was formed. This uh, committee included representatives from the Faculty of Medicine, Department of Health and Community Services, uh, as well as the um, uh, MNL. And these partners recognized that there was a significant issue happening. Uh, of course, 2021 was when we started to hear very loudly uh, about the, uh, the, uh, the, the leaving of our family doctors and the, the real challenges that were experienced in many of the medical, uh, many of the professions within the medical field. So this group identified uh, right up front that there was a role for municipalities to play. Um, one of those in particular was our coordination with um, uh, students, med medical students who were out into our communities doing their residencies and so on. So the recommendations, uh, sorry, that uh, committee um, had recommendations from a workshop that they held. Uh, this was before MNL got engaged. And there were 10 recommendations and seven organizational partners at the table. And recommendation number 10 of that workshop was to engage in recruitment and retention processes focused on marketing communities and making newcomers feel more welcome. Those partners included the Department of Health and Community Services, as I said, one faculty of medicine and led by us. But the others that were at the table included uh, the regional health authorities, uh, the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Newfoundland and Labrador, uh, the NLMA, the Medical Association, um, and of course, Department of Municipal and Provincial Affairs were at that table too, uh, via Sandy Hounsel. That committee did a big piece of work. Um, we were very encouraged by what we were hearing. And of course, you know, then we were dealing with the pandemic. And we also dealt with a number of staff uh, who were tasked with administering this committee uh, left at uh, Memorial University. So things became a little stale for a short period of time. But like anything good in fine fashion, it came back bigger and better than ever. And in September of 2022, the Rural Newfoundland and Labrador Physician Recruitment and Retention Committee was formed. And this essentially expanded on the partnership that had previously been established, but now included uh, representatives from the family practice networks, of which I'm sure you're very familiar, uh, student representatives from the Faculty of Medicine, including undergraduates, postgraduates, postgraduates, indigenous representatives, and international representatives. And of course, we brought the College of Physicians and Surgeons this time, and some patients rep patient representatives. So it really gave us a much deeper appreciation for what was happening on the ground, and of course, a deeper appreciation of what the various partners were experiencing and feeling at that point in time. 
Um, the goal of the committee was to address the 10 recommendations identified in the Rural uh, Newfoundland and Labrador Physician Recruitment and Retention Plan, which was the plan developed after the workshop was completed. Um, similar to the workshop recommendations, this plan, uh, number 10, specifically stated that we were to engage communities in physician recruitment and retention processes, focused on marketing communities and making newcomers feel welcome and valued. But it was expanded a little bit, and I'll go on and explain how. It says, this could include introducing cultural sensitivity and cultural safety training for citizens and school children, community toolkits, and special accommodations or enticements for newcomers related to housing and taxes, for example. So you will see through the recommendations uh, and the various themes that I'm gonna present here today that we've really captured the essence of that goal number 10 uh, from the recruitment and retention plan. Before I go any further, I just wanna commend um, the partners, um, commend the partners that, that were involved in this. Um, oftentimes when we watch the news and we read the papers, you know, we recognize there is a crisis in our healthcare sector. There's no doubt about that. But during my travels and my work, I was constantly hearing people saying, oh, there's nothing being done. There's, you know, I, I hope there's something being done. I see little progress here. But the fact of the matter is there is a lot of work happening under recruitment and retention. The provincial government has expanded their work by hiring an assistant deputy minister who's responsible for this uh, this file. Um, Meg, Dr. Megan Hayes uh, is the individual. Uh, she's practiced uh, in Newfoundland and Labrador and elsewhere and, now, and became an administrator within the health authorities. And now, of course, is the individual specifically responsible for all uh, healthcare recruitment and retention activities on behalf of the government of Newfoundland and Labrador. And they've been wonderful partners to MNL. Um, the fact that they reach out almost every second day, hoping that I'm going to give this material to them in advance, I'll park that aspect, but they're very eager to see what it is that we land on uh, to, uh, to see what municipality, what role municipalities are going to play. To that point, that was the biggest question we had to answer through this whole process. What is your responsibility? There's nothing in our legislation, not a thing that mentions healthcare. However, it probably is one of the most important services to our residents. And as we all know, being the level of government closest to the ground and closest to the people, we're hearing it. We also feel it personally. I was six months without a family physician, and I live in Logie Bay next to a, a you know, major urban center. So if I can feel it in Logie Bay, Middle Cove, Outer Cove, you know, two minutes from the city of St. John's, I can't imagine what it's like when you have to travel three hours or four hours to get to a community and no doctor to be found. I heard it everywhere. I heard the need for all of us to step up collectively and I did ask the question to every individual I spoke to, how can your community engage in recruitment and retention of, in particular, physicians in Newfoundland and Labrador? And of course, as we went on, it got expanded to healthcare professionals in general. And everyone, the vast majority, I can't say everyone, but the vast majority said to me that they want to play a role, they just don't know how. They were engaging with community advisory councils. They were engaging with their public health authority where possible. They were engaging with the, um, the family practice networks. And no doubt, there was some excellent work taking place, but there were, it was pockets. It wasn't consistent across the board. So this material I'm presenting here today um, includes uh, a number of community-based recommendations. And I'm also gonna provide an overview of the tools and other supports that we'll soon post online that can support you in satisfying the role that we suggest that you take here today. So overall, we have 10 themes that we'll touch on this morning and over 20 recommend, recommended actions that your municipality can take to support this issue. I do recognize that capacity is different from different sizes of municipalities, but I do feel that the majority of what we're going to, I'm going to present here momentarily is something that we can all reach and achieve. Uh, whether you're a small community of 15 or 20 people or whether you're in a, a municipality of, of thousands, there is something that you can do here, but I will put the caveat out there. The uh, delineation of regions um, from a healthcare perspective, rural, Gander and Grand Falls, Windsor are still considered rural areas under the healthcare sector. I do recognize that it's going to be a little difficult for the large urban centers, such as St. John's, Mount Pearl, CBS, and Paradise, to carry forward some of these recommendations because they have a different way of doing business. The larger health centers are in their areas, um, and of course, there is a lot of great work happening in those larger centers already. So I'll put the caveat out there that it, this will support everyone, uh, but I do commend those uh, larger municipalities and others 
uh, who are already taking on this responsibility and already putting a lot of work, uh, great work forward and indeed having very good success. So the first theme for this morning is to take a regional approach, something that you've heard every MNL staffer and board member say at this podium over the last uh, number of weeks or last number of days rather, and of course the last number of years. So we recommend that municipalities work together in a more coordinated effort to support recruitment and retention of healthcare professionals. And the way in which we think you can do that is to establish a committee of community representatives from your region, including members of council. Uh, and we do recommend that you assign a lead on behalf of the region. Uh, it should include residents, businesses, and others who will be responsible for those municipal efforts. The businesses, of course, have a, a very important role to play here, and I will reference them uh, a little bit more in the future. Um, but there are many people within your community, the, the others is what I'm referring to, who can bring extensive knowledge and, uh, and uh, skill to the table to, to help uh, you move forward with these recommendations. Um, I worked with the uh, joint mayors of uh, Trinity Bay de Verde for a period of time. And it was one of uh, one of the most active regions I had experienced in my time working with municipalities on this issue. They attended every uh, meeting that they could with the community advisory councils from Eastern Health. They attended uh, pretty much every session they could on this issue. And in fact, they were successful in getting uh, some new healthcare professionals in that region. And of course, you know, a new healthcare professional in that area supports the people of Carbonier and Bay Roberts on the other side and vice versa. So working on a regional approach will be very, very helpful. And uh, we do strongly recommend that you assign a lead, someone that will do the coordination. The second theme is indeed collaboration and partnerships. Uh, so we recommend that municipalities work in partnership and collaborate with, in particular, the new provincial health authority, uh, the community advisory councils that, uh, that have already been rolled out but are now being uh, revisited by the provincial health authorities, and of course, the family practice networks. Family practice networks in particular have a truly, truly deep understanding of the needs of the regions that they represent. Um, I commend them. They've been probably one of the biggest contributors to these recommendations. Uh, they attended our Urban Municipalities Caucus in Grand Falls, Windsor last year and did a presentation around the work that they were doing. And I was pleasantly surprised to sit back in that audience and listen to what they were doing because it's exactly what I wanted to recommend anyway. So there are great resources out there with those family practice networks. A number of them, I believe, today are watching online. Uh, so I would be remiss if I didn't thank them specifically. So under this one, we uh, recommend that you establish direct connections with these key organizations and groups because they will support your efforts. Um, we want you to be ready to offer advice and guidance where possible. And we want you to become the eyes and ears on the ground for those partners regarding the barriers and future needs. We want you to have the discussion. The next recommendation is to create a more welcoming community. That is our role as municipal leaders, is to create a more welcoming community in all aspects for our residents, whether they're current residents or newcomers. We, uh, we recommend that municipalities focus on developing welcoming communities in all aspects of their planning and operations. So for instance, we recommend that you look at your policies. Do they Are they tailored to newcomers to your community or are they more specific to those that have already been there for a period of time? We want you to look at policies that will improve accessibility in general. Uh, you want people to come to your community, make it easy for them to come to your community. And furthermore, we want you to increase engagement. Um, and that engagement is with absolutely everyone that has a, a role to play here. Uh, but in particular, um, talking to your residents, talking to the businesses, and talking to the healthcare professionals that may live already within your borders. The next thing, we got to have a bit of fun. So we are recommending that municipalities coordinate community events to support integration. This is one of the themes that we heard the most about. Um, communities are doing a really great job of offering up information to the newcomers um, in, in terms of community orientations. So we recommend that you do coordinate those types of, of events. We suggest that you hold an open house and a meet and greet so that when a new physician is, is considering coming to your community, invite them into your town hall. Have a meeting, have a, have a discussion, have a chat. Could just be a little coffee break, but you can also uh, encourage your residents to, to participate in that too. We recommend that you host multicultural nights. We've seen that done in a number of regions and they've had great success and great attendance. And the last recommendation under community events is, you know, when an individual moves into your community, they have a family, 
they may have just left all of their friends and all their other family, um, but you want them to meet people. You want them to have fun. You want them to feel as though they are part of that community. And a great way to do that is to offer uh, invitations or access to your community events that you all host. If you're having a, a pancake breakfast, well, you know what? Reach out to that new doctor in your community and their partner and their children and say, come on down. Breakfast is on us. Take that extra little bit of effort to make them feel truly involved in the community. And I guarantee you'll get a great benefit from that. We recommended engaging, uh, becoming more engaging with both residents and businesses. And this one in particular, um, this theme is about residents. And we recommend that you increase this engagement by identifying champions within your community. I just referenced a moment ago, uh, if you have healthcare workers in your cities and towns already, get them involved, ask them to help, um, and ask them their opinion. Engage local committees and groups to support the efforts. We all have community groups, whether it's a recreation association, might be a development association, or everyone can provide um, some contribution to this work. And similarly to what we saw uh, our past president, Tony Keats, talk about uh, the other day, mentorship is extremely, extremely important to creating a welcoming community and, uh, and, and supporting newcomers. So we, do, uh, we suggest that municipalities in some form or fashion develop a mentorship program. And that mentorship program should not only be for the healthcare professional, but also for their spouse or partner. And we also recommend that you work to provide additional supports to that spouse. And that could, those supports can be found in the other recommendations here. For example, uh, there may be a, uh, a drop-in child care play group. Um, so we recommend that you reach out to the spouse if they have children and, and say, hey, why don't you come on over here and meet some new people and, uh, and maybe you'll, uh, you'll learn something or, or uh, find new friends. And of course, as they get connected, they feel more engaged in your community, they feel more part of your community, but they can also find ways to reach out for the additional supports that they require. We may have small communities in some instances, but we're mighty communities. We're very, very good at what we do. And uh, at the end of the day, we just need to go that extra little bit to make sure that the healthcare professionals uh, are truly targeted as part of your work. The next recommendation is to engage local businesses. Um, I, I saw, I had a really great example of this one and uh, it was out in the, uh, the town of Deer Lake and I see the, the mayors here and other representatives of council. And they reached out of course to um, the local businesses to support um, the development of welcome kits and welcome baskets and so on. Uh, for newcomers to their community. I've heard of other local communities doing the exact same, and they've had great, great success. One thing about Newfoundland and Labrador, we have a lot of great suppliers and a lot of great businesses that create a lot of really cool products and good products and delicious products. And when an individual comes into your community, they may be from anywhere in the world. And of course, as we always do, we want to give them the taste of Newfoundland and Labrador. You're going to the businesses in your community, encouraging them to be part of this is a great way to give everyone a, a taste of what Newfoundland and Labrador offers in that regard. We suggest that you identify champions within that community, and they will provide the support for these efforts. We want you to engage in local businesses to create welcome gifts and baskets and so on and encourage purchasing discounts where possible. There was one coffee uh, house, I'm not sure exactly where it is now off the top of my head, I should have had it, uh, but they used to offer a free coffee in the morning uh, to healthcare workers as they made their way to work. Something like that can go a long way. People feel valued, they feel special, and they realize that you recognize their value. Um, we also suggest that um, that you work with business, uh, the local businesses uh, that offer childcare and solicit their support where possible. Of course, access to spaces is important, but even if there was a possibility to expand the availability of space with the municipality support, we encourage you to do that. Like anything we do, training and education is absolutely key. So we recommend that municipalities work with local partners to undertake um, new, uh, or sorry, offer new training uh, and educational opportunities. And based on our research and, uh, and talking to various groups and organizations, there are a number that I've listed here today, but there's a much bigger list that will soon be coming. We recommend sensitivity training, cultural competency training, anti-racism training, as well as respectful language and reconciliation training. All of these things will ensure that you're creating a more welcoming community for those individuals.
The next recommendation is uh, related to housing and other supports. Uh, this is one, of course, many of you have heard recently related to the uh, the town of Bonavista and the work that uh, they that they were doing, offering land to their um, uh, to their uh, their physicians. Um, but I'll get further into the taxation and land piece next. But under housing, we suggest that you begin developing um, a list of available housing opportunities in your community, rental housing. Um, this will ensure that resident students that work in your healthcare facilities have a place to stay locally. Because uh, most recently, when the residents were being placed at Memorial University, uh, approximately 80% of them were placed in the first round of placements. But the other 20, they, want, they could have been placed if there was housing in the rural communities that they wanted to work. Unfortunately, uh, we saw a number of residency positions in uh, clinics and healthcare facilities across this province go unfilled because there was nowhere for the student to stay. You folks know what's available in your community. You know the, how the homeowners, you know the individuals that own the local motel, you know the individuals that have Airbnbs or rentals or things along that line. Having a very basic inventory of those or keeping it on top of mind at the very least will go a long way to ensure that we can get future uh, student or sorry, current students into your community to do their studies so that they can become future long-term residents and supporters of the work that you need them to do. Um, uh, further to that, the department, or sorry, the Faculty of Medicine, Distributed Medical Education Division, um, they distribute RFPs all the time for accommodations. And some of you may have seen some emails from me. Uh, I think the Stephenville region and Port of Port region, I've sent a few out to them. And we've had great feedback. Uh, the CAO of those, some of those communities and town managers sending in uh, contact information to the Faculty of Medicine saying, hey, I know this landowner and property owner. He's got a four-room house. It's a high-quality place that can take an animal if, if need be. Um, and it's available for the next uh, eight months. That is exactly what those students need. And without having connected to the municipality and that town stepping up and actually doing a bit of work, they probably would have lost four resident students in Stephenville. Um, the availability of housing is an issue. We all know that. Um, but we do know that there is availability in some instances. And as long as you are ready to present that availability uh, to the Faculty of Medicine and the provincial health authorities, you will be doing your part in ensuring that we can get residents in your community, as I said, who will hopefully become long-term uh, supporters of the medical field. We also recommend that you develop a policy inventory. Um, I know many of you have great websites and you're posting your policies there. Uh, at MNL, we had a, uh, a work term student last summer, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, he spent uh, six weeks trolling your websites, looking at uh, documentation you had online, and he pulled out as many policies as possible that we could find. And of course, our purpose was to be able to share them with other members. But from, a, from the perspective of healthcare recruitment and retention, it will allow the healthcare sector and of course you as communities to identify where there may be gaps, where you may need a new policy or something that can support uh, recruitment and retention. Um, it would be great if every one of you could have that full comprehensive list of all the policies that you maintain uh, on your website moving forward. And the purpose for that, not only what I just said, but as a newcomer to a community and say, for instance, you wanna build a shed uh, on a property that you just purchased. And if you don't know where to go, and you're a professional that's working 18 hours a day, and your spouse has a job and you have children, you really probably don't have a lot of time to look into the development regulations and figure out, can I build that shed to put my snowblower uh, in there to store? And if that is the case, then those individuals don't feel like they're satisfying their role as a, um, a you know, the, the, the father or mother or partner of the, the relationship. Um, they'll feel as though that they can, you know, get the, they have to go somewhere else or they can go somewhere else and get the stuff easier. You want to retain them. You want to keep them in your community. So like anyone, when you become a member of the community, you grow, you build your properties, you maintain your properties. And we're all under governance in that regard. And of course, without a clear list of uh, policies for those individuals to easily access, we may see them uh, move out of our communities. Very similar to the service inventory. Um, most municipalities do a really good job of putting on their website what services they offer, whether it's recreation, fire services, waste management, but there is an enormous gap uh, in that regard as well. So we recommend you develop a comprehensive service inventory and post it online and make it easily accessible. The next recommendation is to develop a business listing. Now, I know this is a challenge. There are many businesses that don't register. Um, we believe that there's a dual benefit to this one. 
you'll have a service listing or sorry, a business listing for newcomers to your community to be able to say, here's where you get your fresh bread. Here's where you can get your groceries. Here's where you can purchase clothing and so on. But also, as you put this listing out, uh, out there, more businesses may realize there's an opportunity here and they may register for you. And that's additional tax dollars. So we encourage you to start that listing and give um, other businesses the opportunity to register quickly and, and get on that list. And of course, in any way possible, share that list out, encourage people to use those local vendors and local suppliers. We also recommend that you create a comprehensive community activity list. And we really want this one to be um, the regional aspect. We want you to work with your neighboring communities. For instance, um, if you look at the community of uh, Brigus and the community of Cupids, the community of Cupids has a celebration around Cupid's Days and so on. Brigus has the Blueberry Festival. So rather than just sending out a notice that says, oh, the Blueberry Festival is this day, why don't you send out a notice to residents and the newcomers uh, through the healthcare sector for every event over that four or five week period, all within you know 20 minute drive of where they live? Again, they'll feel part of the community. They'll feel engaged. And uh, at the end of the day, you've got another product that's going to benefit you elsewhere by encouraging tourism and so on. The next theme, um, and this is more of a, the more contentious one, um, is uh, taxation and land. So we do recommend that all municipalities, uh, and many of them are already doing it, but we recommend everybody get on board with this, offer tax relief to the private clinics and health-related businesses uh, per your authority under the Municipalities Act. You can allow a, a new clinic in your community. You can defer their taxes. You can give them a, a you can uh, write off their taxes, and it's all provided under the Municipalities Act. This is something that some municipalities have toyed with, but they haven't had the ability or the, I guess the knowledge to actually make it happen. So we're going to provide, and I'll talk about the tools later that are going to go along with these recommendations, but we'll provide you the motion of counsel. We'll provide you the draft policy that will allow you to do this effectively. We've seen great success on the Southern Shore uh, for this, uh, this in particular, um, and of course, in some of the rural urban communities, uh, we see clinics that pay zero taxes. Uh, we see them here in Central. I spoke to a, a number of communities here just this weekend uh, that are looking at actually building on to already established public facilities to allow for a clinic to be on the side of that, to be able to say to a physician that might be looking at their community, we already got a spot for you to practice. Come on in. There's no cost to that. You pay for the heat and lights. We'll make sure your taxes are covered. That will go. Let me tell you, I've heard it from all across the country. That can go a long way in getting a doctor in your community for the long term. We also uh, note that you do have access um, or the ability to provide uh, town assets, uh, if available, for home construction or to establish a business uh, within the healthcare sector, but you do require ministerial approval. Now, while we do recommend, this is the more contentious one, while we do recommend that you provide access to town assets, land that you own, not crown land, but town owned land, we need to balance it with the fact that there are other healthcare providers already in your community that may stand up and say, wow, this new doctor is getting an acre of land. I moved here four years ago and I didn't. So we really feel that, sure, if as a region you can identify land amongst your communities that can be allocated to provide for housing and so on, uh, that's great. But most importantly, I'll go back to allow or for creating an opportunity to create a clinic, a place where they can practice. That's something that you can really have success with. Um, sometimes, you know, uh, a postage stamp of land is enough to create a small building that will allow those doctors to practice three or four days in your community. Uh, we've seen uh, the town of Bonavista has offered up land. Uh, I think it was an acre, if David is still here, uh, for um, a $1 to any physician that was willing to move to their region. It does pit community against community when you when you do something like this. But I want you to remember, um, it's not a competition. A doctor in Bonavista supports the community at Kings Point. A doctor in you know Shoal Harbor just outside Clarenville will support the town of Clarenville too. So the reality is, um, you do have this authority. I just, you know, many people have asked us after Bonavista put out their offer, said, oh, wow, what are they doing? Are they going to get in trouble for that? The reality is no, you do have that authority, but we recommend in particular that you look at uh, providing access for the construction of clinics or doctor's offices. So those are the 20 recommendations uh, and the 10 themes, but at m and we recognize there is a much bigger picture 
that we have to continue to focus on. We'll continue to support you in the, um, uh, the rollout of these various recommendations. Um, we will be providing uh, various tools on our website, an actual toolkit that you can print off and use at your council office. But before I explain that a little bit further, I want you to know that MNL, as you've heard all weekend and you hear if you receive our emails, that we're going to continue key advocacy work on all of these topics that you see here on the screen. The regional, uh, regional service sharing and the support of regional opportunities, drinking water. Let's be honest, folks, you know, a doctor's not going to move into your community if they turn on the tap and there's brown water coming out. Um, there's still boil water advisories, these type of things we're going to continue to work on at MNL to support. Uh, the development of new community assets and infrastructure, uh, transportation networks that support greater access to our community, broadband in the most rural communities. Um, I believe we're on that final mile of, uh, of construction of the broadband. And once we can get that broadband into the furthest communities, that will allow us to have a little bit more strength in doing recruitment and retention. And also very important is access to funding uh, to, you know, to pay for these things, to, to make sure that you have the support you need to hold a, an open house and, and things along that line. Um, regard to funding to support these recommendations in particular, uh, we have had some really great discussions with the Department of Health and Community Services. Um, you know, as they roll out their work and they see the, um, the finalization of what I'm doing, um, we'll likely be asking them to provide funding for small grants to be able to support community events or to uh, provide grants uh, to engage uh, businesses that you may not have businesses that are willing to donate, but it would be great if you had a couple of hundred dollars to go out and buy some things for a welcome uh, kit. We've had a very positive response in that regard. Uh, we think that uh, you know we'll be successful there. And, and if not, um, we will try to find other opportunities to support you in all this work. This bigger picture, we're not going to solve it all. There's no doubt about that. But even if we have some success, everything that we accomplish is going to support recruitment and retention of not only physicians and uh, nurses and nurse practitioners and so on, but also just, you know, labor for your community. We have a, little, a big labor crunch in Newfoundland and Labrador. Uh, lots of jobs open in uh, in retail sector and service sector. Um, we need to fill those jobs. We need to maximize uh, the benefit of our economy. And that will then, of course, grow our population. And then, then we'll hopefully see more doctors and more uh, healthcare professionals uh, join, our, join our communities. So in terms of next steps, a um, big piece of work is already done, but there's still uh, some to be completed. Um, so we're completing a, a presentation to you today, our members. Uh, so this is not the first presentation to our members, though. We presented at the Urban Municipalities Caucus uh, just last month and uh, received some good feedback from those municipalities. Uh, but today, of course, is your opportunity to provide us a, a kind of a last a bit of feedback, uh, which is really important to us. Then we're going to proceed with the uh, final development of tools, templates, and other supports. I want to talk about that just for a couple of minutes. <clears throat> it's one thing for us to stand up here at this podium and say, you got to do this, you got to do that. That's what I've been doing for the past 25 minutes. The reality is you, many of you don't have that capacity. Um, you don't have the tools to do that job. You want to do them. You, you want to help. But, you know, how do you host an open house? Right? How do you host a multiculturalism night? What is a multicultural night? So we're going to provide um, uh, close on, I believe, 30 templates and tools that will support this work. So for instance, if you're going to host an open house, you're going to have um, a template invitation on our website that you can download and fill in your town name, fill in the date and time and the location, and you can have those printed and you can send them out. We're going to provide you a, a template agenda of you know, what you can say at that open house. Who should bring greetings? Who should say uh, the welcome message? We're going to recommend how you actually accomplish that and how much time it should take and so on. When it comes to recommendations like uh, we talked about taxation and the provision of land and so on, we're going to provide you a draft motion of counsel that you can adopt to pave the way to this. We're going to provide draft policies that allow you to adopt or that we wish that you adopt. And, uh, and again, you can provide uh, support to the newcomers. I'm just going to jump back to a couple of the other recommendations here to make sure that I've got them all covered for you. Um, of course, when it comes to the uh, documenting the available accommodations, we're going to provide you an actual template form that you can fill in. It may be as simple as the name of the property owner, the number of bedrooms in that property, and the age or a telephone number or something along that line. 
um, when it comes to developing the comprehensive lists of policies and services in your community, we're going to provide you a couple of examples of communities that are doing it really well. And hopefully you'll be able to mimic their work on your website and so on. For training and education, we will have a list of approved trainers for every one of those recommended training opportunities. You'll know who to call, how much it costs, and when they're available to do that work for you. In regard to engaging your local businesses, I know most of us can go knock on the door and say, hey, can I have a donation for this, that, or the other thing? Um, but some businesses require an appropriate letter to receive that donation. So we'll provide you a template on a donation letter or donation request letter. Uh, when we're doing the uh, business listing, I've got a couple of examples of phenomenal spreadsheets that municipalities use to note every single business in their community. Um, we're going to provide you access to those. All of these tools <clears throat> will pave the way to making it a lot easier for, uh, for you to actually satisfy these recommendations. We also know that um, you know, many of us can phone individuals in our community, the, the residents and the, the other experts and say, hey, come on over to this meeting, let's have a chat. But there are others that you may not know them very well. They may uh, be relatively new to your community. So we'll actually even provide a letter uh, to encourage residents to get involved in this issue and similarly for the businesses. We also have key contact lists available to you for all of the family practice networks, all of the community advisory committees, and of course, all the new representatives uh, in the provincial health authority that are responsible for this. We have their emails, telephone numbers, and they're going to be asking that you reach out to them and get involved, and, uh, and they'll help us support your work as well. So all of these things, <coughs> excuse me, all of these tools will support your work. They will grow as time goes on. As we see you engaging in this work and, and developing new ways to accomplish success, we'll ask you if, for instance, you developed a really great poster for a multicultural night, we want that poster. Send it in to us. Let us see it. Um, we'll then maybe create a template poster that 10 or 12 other communities can utilize. We need to learn together. We need to grow together. And at the end of the day, we will hope that we will encourage more people to our communities uh, but the overarching goal is to create a welcoming, more welcoming community for all residents, whether they're in the healthcare sector or anyone else. <clears throat> the last uh, step that we will take um, will be the final, I guess, publishing of these recommendations and all those tools on our website. Uh, so we will launch the official toolkit uh, in June. There will be an online component, but it'll also be in PDF form so that you can print it and provide it to uh, your council office or to others within the community. It will be public facing uh, so the general public can see what you're doing, all transparent and upfront. And of course, uh, we would hope that as we have success, those tools and the, uh, the items we put online will hopefully become uh, a positive resource for others across the country and in other areas uh, that have very, very similar issues with recruitment of, uh, of physicians and uh, healthcare professionals. So that is the 10 themes, 20 recommendations, and uh, a taste of some of the templates and tools that we're going to provide for you. I'm very uh, eager today to hear your thoughts on uh, whether your municipality can satisfy some of these. I'm also interested to hear if you feel that you can satisfy some of them. Um, because obviously we're going to, as I said, we're going to grow together. We're going to tweak this toolkit as time goes on to make sure that we are uh, carrying forward with the best practices and successful ways of doing things. Uh, but I'll certainly open it up now to the floor if you have any questions or comments on what you heard. Jump to the mic. Um, I'm really new on council, so just since January. However, our town... Uh, just a small little rural town. Um, we have a clinic in our town uh, that used to have a doctor, but um, unfortunately, Dr. Watts passed away about four or five years ago, something like that, and had a house that he could come and reside in. And he serviced other communities three other communities up the up the coast. Um, so when he passed away, a huge hole Absolutely. for three of our communities. Um, so we have the housing still available. It's just been vacant all these years. Uh, how do we, like we have 
quite a few of this in place for us. Yep. But yet now it's like, who do we lobby in order to fill that need up for a doctor? We have had a nurse practitioner kind of yep. offered into the community, yep. but the residents are still really desiring a doctor. Right now we have to, in order to see a doctor, you have to go down to Rocky Harbor. Mm -hmm. All their doctors are, are not really taking on new clients because they're off full. Yeah. So who would we lobby? Yeah. Well, a, a big part of what we recommended here today is that you work on a regional approach with various partners in your region. So the, uh, the community advisory councils, the family practice networks, the provincial health authority, and so on. None of these recommendations can create people. Right? I, I don't mean to sound uh, you know, flippant, but we can't create doctors. But what we can do is create an environment that they consider working in Newfoundland and Labrador a desirable outcome for their education. Um, we do know that the Faculty of Medicine is working very, very hard to encourage more rural distribution of the students. There are all kinds of grants available for people in your community to go and get a full medical degree as long as they are committed to coming back to the community and practicing for a period of time. Uh, the family practice networks are doing all kinds of outreach to students um, and just bringing them out for some mentoring even before they had to do their residency. Um, they're touring them around. They're, uh, they're going and holding workshops and, and study sessions in rural communities. There's a lot of activity actually happening. Again, most of you may not know about most of it, but I will say we can't create people. So if you work on these, uh, these recommendations, if you create that welcoming community, and then you engage those organizations, at least the message will get back to the students that this community is a desirable place to live. It's a desirable place to raise a family. Um, right now, there are many regions of the province that are, do not have doctors, and that is part of the reason. The residents have gone there and not had a positive experience. Nobody reached out to them to say, welcome to my community. They had no idea there was a local government. They, you know, they ran into a person at the store who they thought was the mayor, in fact, was the chair of the rec committee. They had no idea who these people were, what role they played in the community. So again, we as municipalities can create welcoming communities. We can create easier, or facilitate easier access to our programs and services and those things. That'll benefit everybody. But it will also spread back through the system that your region is making efforts to welcome them. And that will go a long way. The students that we heard from on this committee, um, that was one of the first things they said. When the residency notices go out, they Google the communities that are on that list and they see what's going on up there. They'll say, do they have a hockey league? Right? Do they have a basketball team? Uh, is there a school there for my child? If they can't get the answers to those questions at their fingertips, they're not choosing your community. Government can't force, the provincial government cannot force a, a doctor to practice in a certain area. But if you lay out why it would be so great for them to practice in your area and why your community is such a great place to live, they will potentially choose your community. Um, we do know there is a shortage of students in that, uh, that area. Um, but I also know that some of the programs and some of the grants and bursaries that are utilized uh, for rural physicians are completely underutilized and undersubscribed. So, you know, I, I don't, uh, I, I don't want to sound funny here, but if you have a really smart individual in your community who's graduating grade 11 or 12, encourage them to, to go toward medical school and, you know, work with the partners to actually provide the details around the scholarships and the bursaries to those students directly. Uh, they may not find them on their own, but the Family Practice Network could tell you that there's three scholarships available for students on the Northern Peninsula to go to medical school. And you would hope that that student would choose their home community to come back and practice. But if there's no housing, they're not going to be able to go there. If when they turn down the tap for brown water, they're not going to go there. Um, so we need to do everything we possibly can as municipalities and local leaders to create the environment. And there is no doubt that they, the people will come after that. But I will qualify what I just said with we can't create more people. Um, and there, all, there always will be areas that will struggle in this regard. But again, let's get a doc. If we can get a doctor in one community, that doctor can support three or four communities over. Um, so work together, right? And uh, and come up with our solutions that way. Thank you. You're welcome. Rudy. Hey, Rudy Norman, Mayor of Burlington. I'm the president of the Brad Power Fan Club. Um, <laughs> 
I, uh, I, I think I think what you said here today is great, even though I think you're trying to recreate the, the Grand Seduction movie. Absolutely. And, uh, I'll, I'll call Mark Rich and tell him you'll you'll be on the list. Um, I think this is this is great and, and it's great information and and we can take a lot from this. Um, but you only gave us nine themes. Well, oh, really? Did I yeah. know? <laughs> well, thanks for counting, Rudy. I didn't so, miss anything, so maybe what maybe I should have said up to nine themes. Up to, up, to, up to ten. My apologies okay. there. <laughs> I'm still president of the fan club. Sounds good. <laughs> So when I post this online, I'll change that 10 to a nine. I listen, Rudy, remember one thing about me. I'm a writer, not a mathematician. <laughs> My apologies for that. Maisie, over to you. Uh, this is from a rural point of view. And there were two things you didn't mention, and I'd like for you to consider when you go back to your committees. Okay. Is uh, one thing, our schools, when we bring in doctors and their families, their kids, uh, sometimes those kids, of course, they're different than the others, and they're harassed a little bit because they're from a different country, they speak differently, they look differently, etc. Uh, and talking, sometimes when you talk to the teachers about it, they say, oh, it'll work itself out. But in the meantime, those kids are miserable and their family are miserable. Yeah. I think if, like a whole guy once said, there's no good to have the education, you ain't got to learn. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we can't assume that because they're educators they got common sense that's right. that's right so i think maybe if the department of education when a teacher go on these trainings all the time if they point out to them that in a small rural town you know when a new doctor is coming in mm -hmm. you know where he's coming from and everything yeah. about him so if they take that advantage to teach their kids about a country, the different cultures and the language and everything they know a little bit about that and then they're in they, more interested the kids come in and not likely to be harassed. Absolutely. And I think that's important in keeping them. In. Big time, big time. One other thing is that private clinics, okay? And, uh, uh, when a doctor comes into a private clinic, a lot of doctors come in the rural Newfoundland, they know they're only going to be there for a year or two years because they're only there to get certified or whatever. And they're moving on. They're not interested in whether that clinic is modernized, a computer system, or whatever. If you've got a doctor that's coming in and they want to stay in that community, they want to be up to date in a modern community. They don't want to be using paper files, etc. But they're blocked every way they turn, and it's not always a friendly place to work. But when they look at, like, the old help board system is that, well, they don't have any control because they're private clinics. Now, to me, that's a bunch of garbage because the thing is, those clinics are sending their invoices into the government and then the government is paying it. Yeah. If the government can consolidate our hamlets, I think they can do something about private clinics to insist that, that they be up yeah. to standard. And also that there's somewhere for their doctors if they're not happy to go and talk to them and don't tell me the college of physicians because that doesn't work either. Yeah, yeah. thank you, Maisie. That, that's a really great point, uh, both actually. With, pardon me? There you go, exactly. Um, training, for the, training for the community, as, as we referenced in this presentation, um, it doesn't include just the, the adults. It includes at the school level, at the town level, um, all levels, right? Um, a recreation committee should go through cultural sensitivity training just as well as students go, should go through it. Um, I will say that the absence of the school districts at this table was noted. Um, of course, we didn't create the committee. We, we joined the committee. Um, but it was noted and uh, it was flagged multiple times, um, you know, creating a, a welcoming environment for the spouse and the children is just as important as the supports for the physician themselves. And as you said, you know, if the children feel harassed or not, uh, you know, felt as part of that community, they're going to be moving as quick as they moved in. Uh, so excellent point you make. I will certainly bring it back to the group and say that I heard it from our members too, the same thing we were saying. Um, but in regard to um, the clinics and uh, and that work, um, while nothing under our uh, themes or recommendations speak to that, I do know for a fact that there is work taking place amongst the, the Rural Recruitment and Retention Committee uh, to get be better 
plans in place for how those clinics are funded, the way in which they get discounts uh, for various levels of service that they provide and so on. Um, there's a big piece of work that needs to take place there, but rest assured, there is a piece of work taking place. Um, I do anticipate in the next six months, you may hear some tweaks to the uh, uh, the way in which they establish those and pay for those, those clinics. Um, I can't announce it. Obviously, it's not my place. Um, but I do recommend on a regular basis, check the Department of Health and Community Services website. Uh, they do have a recruitment and retention web page. And anytime they have a new initiative, they specifically post it there. And uh, I will say, of the 10 recommendations that this committee is working on, um, a greater funding model for the delivery of that private service is one of the recommendations. Um, but it was uh, categorized as red on the list of uh, progress. Um, it, you should be proud that MNL and our work on your behalf has ensured that we were the first green mark on that list. So we really came to the table and got this done. And uh, we would hope that that's creating motivation with the other partners to get their pieces done because we're all going to look down on them now saying, where's your documents? Where, where's your work? Where's your changes? So, uh, but excellent point. Thanks for that. And I will bring it back to the group. Yeah. Down and back. Uh, my name is Melanie Young. I'm the deputy mayor of Deer Lake, but I'm also a family physician. Um, so I guess I just wanted to chime in and to let everybody know that uh, you can do this. As family physicians, I mean, we are health professionals. You choose the lowest paid specialty. You choose to work in Newfoundland. Um, so clearly we're not people that are solely motivated by money. And as physicians, we get paid the same no matter where in Newfoundland we practice. So what will recruit physicians to your community is your community. So in Deer Lake, we've created um, a committee, uh, the Health and Wellness Committee. It is, our mandate was fivefold, but it was really in terms of promoting health promotion, health prevention, um, in terms of physical wellness, mental wellness, food sustainability, uh, creating connections within our community, connections among each other, connect, uh, connections to our heritage, our culture, um, just creating a really inclusive and welcoming community. And lastly, you know, improved access to primary care. And in a year and a half, um, we recruited, oh, sorry. And I know we have a privileged insight because we're into what uh, attracts us rare birds, but we've uh, recruited one physician and three allied health professionals. Um, we've really focused on creating a community within the larger community. And I think that's where our biggest value has been. Uh, we have bowling nights, we have gala nights, we, we take our health professionals and we can connect them together socially. Um, a physician in a small rural community, I can tell you, is like living in a fishbowl. You know, I can't even, I don't even get groceries in my own hometown, right? Um, so, you know, if you can connect those people to one another, it creates a network, it creates a community within a community that will not only get doctors and get health professionals to your communities, but they'll stay there. And I always, uh, you know, I drive Mike nuts, but I always say, you know, the biggest and best um, way in which to recruit health professionals is to have a ridiculously heavy bunch of people who love where they work, they love who they work with. And medicine is a small community yes. that ripples. And if people love where they work, if they love where they live, they will come and they will stay. Two big things, I think, in terms of, you know, some of the things that you had mentioned, I, I believe you're from Cowhead. Um, get learners into your community. If you're lucky enough to have physicians in your community, go talk to them. They know why they came there. They know what keeps them there. Um, go talk to them, uh, reach out, support them uh, in terms of getting more learners into your community. If you get people to come into your community, you can show them how fabulous it is, uh, but you have to get them there. And as learners, we're, we're forced to go out. I mean, if you go to Memorial, you're forced to go out, you know, you pretty much practice everywhere in Newfoundland by the time you graduate. Uh, so it's a good opportunity to get them into your community. Um, show them, you know, all the things, like you said, the welcoming initiatives, you know, whether it's minor hockey, you know, all those things that you can do. Um, so definitely, you know, get the learners into your community if you can. There was a mention about space. Um, incredibly important. I mean, as we graduate now as family physicians, we come out carrying a student loan debt of about $300,000. 
uh, that's a mortgage without a house, right? So to create a clinic itself, I mean, when you go to the doctor, that one hospital bed is eight grand. So as someone who's coming out, who's already in the hole, $300,000 to go to a, a community and to create that space is just an extra expense that I guarantee you they will not take. So if you have the opportunity to do that, and it doesn't have to be modern. I mean, look where we practice in Deer Lake um, yep. and we make it work. Um, you just, but asking a new grad to take on that expense is just another extra hurdle that you don't want um, for your community to have to kind of overcome. So that would be two, two things that I would certainly add to your list and go into your community. Like you said, the, the early learners, um, I'll stop now, but um, no, it was great. Miller. Keep yeah, it no, I'm passionate about it, but uh, go into your community, go into your schools, go into primary, create initiatives that make them comfortable with going to the doctor, teddy bear clinics, things like that. That grows a love of medicine right from the get go. I went to MedQuest um, grade nine is a, a, a program put off by Memorial and I was actually paid. My community put me through a uh, MedQuest, which is a week you go to St. John's, you live in St. John's, you go to, you know, do autopsies and all kind of really cool, super cool things. But that, all these years back, um, here I am, you know, in Ghana, I went off to school, I went to U of T um, in Toronto, and then now I'm back living in the same community that I grew up with, a uh, family doctor and deputy mayor. So those little initiatives, they, they come back. Melanie, the fact that you are <laughs> absolutely like, the, the fact that you came home to, to practice medicine um, and you also ran for council, I admire you so much. Thank you very much for what you do. I was so proud to watch what Deer Lake was doing. Mike and I, uh, Mayor Gusney and I talked many, many times around the great initiatives that you folks were taking on and talked about the success that you had. And we kept a keen eye to Deer Lake for all of these recommendations and how you went about your business. Um, we've got a lot to learn from you folks. You've had success. You do have a very welcoming community created and a, a very much a strong community atmosphere. And that's exactly what we're talking about here today. So thank you very much for everything that you both have done. And uh, thank you for being a wonderful family doctor. <laughs> Yeah, and we definitely, everything we've done, a lot of this has been created over the last year and a half in terms of our community mandates and uh, structure, but we're happy to share. So just Absolutely. reach out to us. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much. Any other questions or comments? Thank you, any new <laughs> Mr. Mayor, go ahead. I'm Andrew Shea from the town of Fogo Island. Uh, we've been more directly involved with recruiting doctors ourselves. Uh, we find that, you know, like Fogo Island has a good reputation as a tourist industry and people know us. So they want, so we think people want to come there. But there's a lot of problems with central health and the College of Physicians and Doctors mm -hmm. because it's an overlap. We've had doctors who had a license applied for through the College of Doctors and Physicians in no time was approved, but had to go through the same rigmarole here at Central Health and just decided not to come. So we have one recruited uh, coming to Fogo Island. We have another lady recruited in the States who is going to be coming the summer. I call her every three weeks and talk to her and ask her uh, anything we can help you with. You know, can we help you with your working visa and things like that? Because uh, we're not going to have clinics on Fogo Island. We're coming to work at the hospital. Yeah. We have houses at the hospital where you can be on call and, and sleep in your own bed. The school is across the road. We have those things and we're working with you know, but, but the way it's set up in Newfoundland is that you go to BC and you want to be a doctor, you go through the College of Physicians and, and Surgeons, and you can go there and do what you like, basically. You can go where you like. But in Newfoundland, you can't do that. You've got this big rigmarole. And we've had people who have applied to come just to Fogo Island and were told that there was no need of, uh, of uh, locums on Fogo Island were filled. And yet we got no one there. And that's factual. So we are working with the College of Physicians. We're working with Central Health. And we think some of the things needs to be, be cut out. And what you're talking about here this morning is great. But you got to remember that, you know, we're seven volunteers in a small Understood. community. And we got to do all this work. We were with the fire brigade this morning. 
They told us all the work we got to do. How can we do all this? Yep. It's impossible. We're doing the best we can. And I think we have to recruit people who want to live on Fogo Island. Yep. We had a doctor there from the Middle East who stayed 10 years mm-hmm. and only left because he was working 24-7. Yep. Yep. We've worked with the College of Physicians. We talked to the minister. The doctor that's coming there now is not going to work 24-7 because we've seen to it and worked this out. I, He's going to come and work her shift, you know, and, and work her calling. That's it. Yeah. So we have to do those things, too, because that's Absolutely. very important. Yeah, no, excellent point, uh, Mr. Mayor. And uh, I remember you brought this issue up with, uh, to me at the Gander Conference here, in, or the conference here in Gander just last fall. Yes. And I had the opportunity to bring it back to the group. Um, I referenced for Maisie a few minutes ago that there's various other recommendations that are being worked on. And uh, while I don't remember which specific one relates to some of the things you're speaking to, um, easier certification and quicker certifications yeah. are part of the overarching recruitment and retention efforts. Uh, they haven't announced all the details in that yet, but I'm hopeful that we will see an improvement because you're absolutely right. You know, we can do everything that we recommend here today, and we'll all hopefully get to a common level based on the fact that we're putting these recommendations out. But if there are other barriers, we've got to make sure that we communicate that the yeah. author's got to bring down those barriers because what are we doing it for? If you know that exactly what you said is going to happen the moment you get someone interested, yeah, right. Yeah, and, and for people who are working with and trying to get doctors, make sure you contact the central health. We got a doctor coming down. She's got a new uh, computer program that she works with. If we don't get keep at it, it'll be two months before it's done. That's right. So we're yeah. we're calling them and finding this out. So if you can know a doctor that wants to come, check with central health, see what they're doing with them, see what they're doing for them. Yeah. Call the College of Physicians and Doctors. And the minister, he'll call you back. I tell you, yep. we've tried to get hold of the minister of health, and he's called us back in no time. Within a day, he gets back to you. Yeah, thank you. Good. Thank you very much. Great comments. Well, folks, thank you very much for your time today. Um, I hope that you look forward to the uh, publishing of this stuff online. Uh, when it goes out, please push it out to everyone that you know. Uh, thank you for your time, and I'll hand it back to Amy to end up the session.